Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Round the Table. Great to see you all again. And um, we are in Mark chapter six, and we are going to look at verses 45 through to 56. So I will just pull this up on share screen, and Edmund, if you could read from your um, Jewish Bible, that would be great. Immediately, Yeshua had his disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of him toward the other side of the lake, toward Bethsaida, while he sent the crowds away. After he'd left them, he went into the hills to pray, and when night came, the boat was out on the lake, and he was by himself on land. He saw that they were having difficulty rowing, because the wind was about uh, against them. So at about four o'clock in the morning, he came towards them, walking on the lake. He meant to come alongside them. Uh, other versions say he, he went to walk past. Um, so you take your, take your choice. Courage, he said. Um, they thought he was a ghost and let out a shriek, for they'd all seen him and all were terrified. However, he spoke to them. Courage, he said. It's I. Stop being afraid. He got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. They were completely astounded, but they didn't understand about the loaves. On the contrary, their hearts had been made stone-like. After they made the crossing, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored. And as soon as they got out of the boat, the people recognised him and began running around throughout that whole region, bringing sick people on their stretchers to any place where they heard he was. Wherever he went, in towns, cities or country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the fringes on his robe, and all, all who touched it were healed. Great. Thank you, Edmund. And good evening, Segon. Good to see you. So let's have a look at that. Just bringing up my notes. So, as uh, as you remember, last week we were looking at the feeding of the five thousand, and Jesus dismisses the crowds, and um, they've picked up their twelve small baskets of scraps of bread and fish and then immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd after leaving them he went up on a mountainside to pray when evening came the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them about the fourth watch of the night he went out to them walking on the lake he was about to pass them by and as um, Edmund's version said um you know and the question people ask is why was jesus passing them by and the commentator that i was reading said possibly it's better translated or is intended to pass their way um so which would back up edmund's version uh, translation um but the commentator then goes on to say or perhaps better passing by alludes to God passing by Moses in Sinai. Oh. Edmund, do you have any thoughts about that? I um, that that's an interesting one. Um, I'd not I'd not come across that one. Um, a person I happened to hear this afternoon um, was saying that um, uh, he 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 sometimes thinks this is Jesus's sense of humour. And he sort of did a thing and, hi, guys, how you doing? <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Um, which was another interesting way of uh, looking at it. Um, but, um, <laughs> Somehow, I'm not quite sure that fits into um, Mark's whole uh, sort of story plan here. Yeah. 
yeah, but he did it very well, and I was uh, <laughs> I was amused by that. It's interesting that I happen to be reading Job today, and I haven't bring up, brought up my alternate Bible on the screen, but I think it was um, Job um, nine eight. Uh, uh, if you get there before me. Um, and I wondered if I'd noted it before. You'll see why if I've got the right place. Um, yeah. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Treads on the waves of the sea. There it is. And that's talking about the most high, the creator of the universe. So there's one of those references. They would know that reference. You've got Jesus walking on the waves of the sea and thinking, well, what is all this about? Which we talked about earlier in another place. Um, uh, and and also uh, a thing that I was reminded of was that for, for them, it just seems that every time they go across the lake with, with or without Jesus, something bad happens. And uh, I don't know whether you'll remember a few weeks ago, I, uh, I was talking about the abyss, which is what they call the sea. And it's the equivalent, they would have the same feeling about being on water as we would think in our culture about walking through graveyards. It's not a place you want to hang around. And every time they go across, no, don't send us across again. Every time we go across, something bad happens, you know. So, uh, which I thought, yeah, that's, I like that bit. So I took that on board. Yes, I mean, it's, um, again, it's like Mark showing that Satan is intimately um, involved in what's happening here because the, um, we've got the, you know, the waves and the wind again, which cease immediately that he gets into the boat. So there's definitely, um, there's a lot of power plays, spiritual power plays going on here. Um, and, you know, as Edmund says, they would, they would fully expect to see a spirit or a ghost on the water because of the abyss. And sh sure enough, they were terrified because they saw this um, character walking on the water. And whilst we may not have the same cultural um, view of the sea that they had, if we were on a small boat and saw somebody walking in the middle of the night on the water, I think we would possibly react in terror as well. I don't think, I don't think that's cultural. I think that would be fairly, um, fairly standard because when you see something that, like that, this is not normal. Um, now, and the, um, the bit that struck me that perhaps, you know, we're thinking about them, oh, it's a bit difficult rowing, but um, the guy I was listening to were talking about this he was actually on the Sea of Galilee when he was talking about it. And, um, uh, you know, it's, um, it wasn't just, it was a bit difficult rowing, the, the waves and the storm and whatnot. And they, they're youngish guys, um, well, from his perspective, which I take on board that they tend to be teenagers plus, most of them. And... Um, if you're in the middle of having to struggle and cope with things and you're in a place where you, you don't feel comfortable anyway, you're, you're, you're where the abyss is, um, suddenly to see someone in the middle of, you know, you're wondering if you're going to sink anyway and all of a sudden you see this figure, um, that's just going to be amplified in the midst of storm and dark and all sorts. Yeah, uh it, I think any of us would be terrified in that situation. And then it, uh, Mark goes on to say, immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And playing off the same comment the, um, as intended to pass them by, or perhaps better passing by, alluding to God's passing by in Moses in Sinai, commentator says, it is I, mirrors the divine form of revelation, I am. So there's, I think there's a, quite a play of words and thought there um, on this sort of, you know, the epiphany of God passing by and declaring, you know, I am. 
Edmund, have you got any thoughts yeah, on I, that? Well, uh, until you said it hadn't struck me, but immediately I thought, you know, um, uh, God passing by so Moses can only see, see his back, you know, and you think, do you know that that does that, that does work very well, but I I'd not I'd not come across that one, but I, I think that works very well, particularly because of the resonance with walking on the water being this is the creator God. It isn't just mm -hmm. saying this is God. In that passage in Job, it he mapped out the whole earth and did it. I mean it's it, it's written in big letters in that, but it's not just uh, a normal thing. It uses a very um, the terminology for God in the Job passage is, is you know it's it's God with bells on. I'm in reading the, the Amplified, and it says, "Take courage, it is I." And then in brackets, it's got "I am." Mm -hmm. Yeah. In in the book of Exodus, isn't there an instant where uh, Moses, God is going to God is going to kill Moses because Moses has seen his face or something? Does that ring a bell? Uh, Exodus uh, chapter. I two think you're four. mixing up two ones. There is yeah. a thing that no one, can, God says, no one can see my face and live. Yeah. But the one where God, it says very curiously, God set out to kill him. Yeah. Uh, and it actually, his wife sorts it out, Zipporah, because she circumcises the son who That's hasn't it. been circumcised. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, the, the scholars say all sorts of strange things about uh. that. To yes, be that's... honest, I think that's a bit mysterious, and I haven't. I haven't. It's it's hu that is hugely mysterious. It's a fascinating. It's an like Exodus chapter, uh, two or three or four, I think. Yeah. Um, is that the uh, you're a blood husband to me or something? Yeah, yeah. You're a yeah. you're a husband of blood to me. Yeah, I did a study on that one time and came out none the wiser. <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I did really. A quite then, a deep study of it, uh, going through the commentaries, and yeah. there's there's probably as um, for every commentary you read, there's a slightly different opinion as to yeah, what that yeah. means. Blood on the feet, and there's all sorts of weird things they come out with, and I think, well, Lord, I'll just accept something happened there, but unless yeah. you make it more obvious to yeah. me, I'm not going to pick one rather than another. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting, though, isn't it? I, I think um, cause I'm reading the Old Testament a lot in the message version because that's, you know, because it's such modern English, despite the annoying Americanisms, it, it's very easy to read it. And what, you know, it's just like a novel. What strikes you is real Game, game of Thrones stuff. You know, a lot, you know, judges, and it, well, the, the Pentateuch judges, Samuel, so on, so forth, you know, the, the violence. But what strikes you is what very, very primitive people they were. You know, um, very very primitive. I think we 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 insist upon looking in the Old Testament through our twenty first century Western eyes, and a cult, a culturally speaking, you just can't do that. It, it is so far removed from what we understand. It, that's what it seems to me anyway. And and the, all they understand, especially in the very early part of the Bible, the Old Testament is, is violence. You know, and God is trying to teach them the most basic morality. You know, which to our to us seems to be bizarre and bloodthirsty. And goodness knows what, and yet. When you read it as a whole, it sort of makes sense to me. You know, we're very primitive people, and God is gradually, you know, raising the standard as, as, as the centuries go by. He raises the standards of morality. There's a part in Samuel, I think, or Kings or somewhere, where God says to them that there's a, somebody's been killed from the uh, one of the uh, Israelite tribes from another uh, people, and um, they're going to kill, they're going to wipe out this, this, this uh, enemy tribe. And God says, no, only kill the people who did the deed, not their families. Previously, you could wipe out all their families. Now I'm telling you, you've got, you've got to just kill the people who did the deed. It's like God is gradually raising the standards and making them less and less, um, you know, what's the word? Bloodthirsty, if you like. Do you see what I mean by that? It's um, yeah, just the, a feeling. Certain, certainly the Mosaic law was radically different to any other yeah. law in yeah. that was extant in the area at the time. I mean just massively more human rights, more caring, particularly yeah. around the poor and then, um, you know, those with no one to defend them. So the widows and the poor, significantly different to the other law codes that were around. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And that, that passage in Exodus four, um, it's a very mysterious passage. And I think the thing I brought away from all the commentaries I read around it 
was that this reflects something that is very ancient. And um, we just don't know. No, don't um, know that. Those, those, when Moses wrote this, the first people who read it would have probably had a much greater understanding. Yes, exactly. And they, they would have read this and, and just nodded sagely. Yeah. And, you know, we're now, um, what, 3,400 years on? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it just Serious. <laughs> radically different culture, yeah. massive amount of time. As you said, the whole evolution of, um, of of what God was doing with that people. Um, and we just don't know. And so no. I, I go with Edmund. It's, it's an interest. It, there are, there are several, not many passages um, in the old Testament that are uh, a mystery. And there are some that are in the new Testament that are a mystery, you know, the uh, baptizing the, de you know, baptism for the dead. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. there's, there's a whole, there's a whole list of things that I've, I've got uh, down to ask Jesus when I see him face to face, if I yeah. actually am even bothered at that point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking about it recently because something that cropped up, I listen in to um, a, a messianic Bible study and um, this guy, the way he w moves around the scriptures is absolutely amazing. I feel like a baby. Um, listening mm. to him but somebody asked him a question about circumcision and this is a real scholar type guy and he he said oh, I was asked last week about circumcision business and and he said I discovered something that was a total shock to me and he said I haven't dug down in a subject like this because of this I can remember that he and he said it appears, looking at the Hebrew, of the thing about circumcising as you're Jewish, he said, it turns out it doesn't use the Hebrew form for a command. It isn't a command. And he thought that can't be right. And so he, he researched over a number of days every single reference to circumcision. And he, he said it had been a profound shock to me. But what it turned, the, the only way he could deal with it was saying, what it does say is that circumcision is a sign that you are a member of the covenant. Uh, that there seems to be a difference. It's not that this is the mark of the, it, well, it is a mark of the covenant, but it's not a command. But if you are under the covenant, this is what you will do as a result of being a covenant member. But it isn't a command. And, and then something did crop up about this bit. And we were wondering whether um, at that point, um, it's like the son of, of Moses um, is it, it, not properly sort of acknowledged, if you like, that the father has not properly gone through the process. So the thing of saying, oh, I'm a covenant member, um, it hadn't quite happened. And therefore, uh, you know, outside of, but it's very difficult. That was as much as we could get mm. out of that. Do you, you know what I mean? Yeah. But mm. I've been thinking about circumcision ever since, because that, that really is mind boggling. But Wayne does know his stuff. And it was a huge shock to him. And he checked every reference in the Bible to circumcision and said, oh, I was sure I was going to find it. It's a command. But he said it is never in Hebrew put as a command. So that's there's a curiosity for you. Mm. No, but it's, it is, but it does make sense that this is a sign. Mm. I said, you know, this is what you do as a sign that you are a son of the covenant. Mm. It, um, you will. It, uh, what did he say? It, it's that you will do this, not that you must do this. Mm -hmm. Was the mm -hmm. distinction he made? Because you were saying that's what you will do, but it wasn't you must do this mm. in Hebrew. 
comes, of course, you've got that, that phrase, circumcision of the heart, don't you, in the New Testament? And in Jeremiah, well, it's in two or three places in the Old Testament as well, yeah. Because that's another quirky thing he said at one point. He said, uh, every Jew gets circumcised, um, women only once, men twice. And we're sort of looking at him, what? And he said, uh, men have to be circumcised in their flesh, but both of them have to be circumcised in their heart, if it's accurate, according to... Um, so, um, yes, because I, I think Christians tend to think that um, it's Christians who think about the circ uh, the, um, the, uh, the the cover uh, the new covenant of the you know written on the heart rather than. Uh, uh, but he said no. Rabbis talk about it all the time. You may be circumcised on the outside, but are you circumcised in your heart? Apparently, that's that's a that crops up a lot in the Talmud. So they're very conscious of. And when the temple was destroyed, those were the verses they went to and said, ultimately, God isn't, uh, it doesn't, although we were asked to do those law, those sacrifices and what have you, the one that God is really interested in is, is to do with the heart and the circumcision of the heart. So you can have a personal relationship with God apart from the sacrifices. And that's quite surprising to us as Christians to know that that's how they resolved that question with the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, yes, I think we make quite a lot of assumptions about um, the Jews that are not based in fact or scripture. Mm. Yeah, so one of the, I mean, when, um, bless him, um, Chris Vallotton was here, um, he, he was mixing a lot of, you know, you said there were a lot of nations around that had different law codes about women and all that. And it was surprising how much stuff that he was saying about Jewish women. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. They specifically were not that because that was the difference between the Greeks and the whatnot all around them. So um, that was a bit jumbled, his version of, of um, some of the things. Judaism were a bit strange. So moving on from that heretical statement, um, <laughs> we will, um, so Jesus, immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, would Mark's building to um, at this, all the, through this passage and, you know, the passages we've been reading and the few passages to come, building to the um, Peter's declaration of Jesus as Messiahship. And Mark, Mark is demonstrating that, you know, the Pharisees and the disciples didn't get who Jesus was. Even though the disciples were so close to him, they still didn't get who he was. And actually, as we go further on and, we, and Peter does declare who he is, we then find that they don't understand actually what Messiah is either because they, they've got their own um, concept of who Messiah is, which does not match Jesus' concept of Messiah, just as the Pharisees had um, a very strong concept of Messiah and that, that again did not match so, um, any thoughts on the hardness of heart, Edmund? Well, I, I was just wondering what various people thought about that, because um, uh, when it talks about um, having a, um, a hard neck or stiff neck like Pharaoh, you know, um, what that actually means is that, um, or, or when Jesus says about... Um, um, divorce and he says um, yes I know Moses um, uh, said you could have a the Jewish word is a get uh, a bill of divorce but it wasn't that from the beginning but because of the hardness of your hearts um, and in that context uh, it means 
your ability to be, um, I presume, open to the idea of forgiving the person and maintaining things. And because we're human, you know, some people can forgive the perpetrators of crimes against them. I saw something on television yesterday where a Muslim woman uh, forgave the guy in court um, who had shot her. Um, she didn't die, but somebody else did. Um, and she forgave him. But not everybody is able to forgive. Um, and it's not because they're bad people, but they don't have that. They're not pliable enough, if you like, their heart. And I wondered if their hearts had been made stone-like, is whether you could translate it to get the sense of, I mean, this is just, you know, I'm floating out there. Their hearts uh, weren't receptive in the same sense of not soft enough to be able to realise what was going on. It was too set in their ways. Um, what, what do people think? Have they got any? Just wanted to add something or say something. Um, and oh. I'll try it to. We can't hear you, Sagan. Can you go a bit closer to your microphone? Is it better now? Oh, that's better. Thank you. Okay, so I, I mean, I was just looking at the entire verse and I'll tie it to something you said um, when you talked about um, at the point where Peter was able to say, um, this is Jesus. So if you look at the way he put it, he first said, and, and I'll take us back a bit when he said, and Jesus um, uh, made an attempt to pass them and they cried out and he was like, okay, you know what, don't worry. And he got on the boat and everything um, became a little bit calmer. It became calm, not calmer, calm, totally calm. And I think uh, it's, it's the way um, Jesus walks with us in our journey. He always gives us an opportunity to step up. Um, and so he, in the way I see it, it was like, oh, I, I make to pass them so that hopefully something has changed. Something has changed from the, the miracle of feeding 5,000. And he's hoping that whatever happened at that stage would have actually... Um, something in their heart would have changed and they could deal with the issue of the boat. Because if you look at it, they said he watched them a bit. So he was hoping something changed and he made to pass them. And when they, when they cried out, he got in and said, okay, fine. And he immediately tied, I mean, if you look at what he said next, he did not say, um, he did not talk about the calmness that came in. He referred back to the miracle of the feeding. So somehow, Jesus would put us in places or uh, in stages where we have an opportunity to build from our recent experiences with him. It doesn't mean he will abandon us, but then it's, it's like an opportunity for growth. Because if you now further down when he talked about where, and I'm sure we'll get there, where he talked about where Peter um, had the revelation when he said, Jesus asked, who am I? And he suddenly said, oh, you are Christ, the son of the living God. The Bible says that, and he started telling them more about his walk towards Jerusalem. So at that point, something in their heart or in Peter's heart had opened up and he gave him an opportunity to share more because they had actually passed that particular test. And so they could receive more. So I think that made attempt to pass was him trying to say, have they actually grown from the experience of feeding 5,000? And when he saw that they hadn't, he had no problems just getting on the boat with them and moving on, saying, okay, you're not ready for this stage yet. Um, let's move forward, you know, maybe another stage when you get there. And again, also it ties down to when he said he did not he did not tell them so much because he told them, oh, you might not be able to handle so much. If not, you have revealed, I mean, we look at further down uh, John's version when he talked about Jesus talking about his walk towards the cross and many other things. So, I mean, I just tied to different Christians in different stages and being able to receive God's word based on experiences. It gives you the opportunity to actually grow and step up in your spiritual work. I like that. Yeah. 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 Anybody else have any thoughts? Are you muted? Does that does explain how you can suddenly refer to the miracle of the bread which in some ways, when you first read it, looks like a, what's that suddenly popping up there? How does that connect? 
but that connects it that connects it very well yeah, I was going to comment on the, the same thing he, he says you know Jesus says they haven't they haven't did you not understand the loaves uh, and it, it, it strikes me that you know there, there's lessons at, on many levels there that he's, he's talking about and pointing out and I I just wonder whether you know people on here would would sort of suggest different different levels and and messages that come out of um, the loaves as as a as a as a phrase for, as a reminder for the the miracle. I guess the feeding of the five thousand the loaves actually revealed how powerful he was, the power, and that he was God. Um, hence the I am bit, it is I, you know, and going back to what Edmund was saying. <clears throat> so they should have recognised that, and they didn't. The, when uh, we started talking about it, it just reminded me of the passage in Isaiah, after Isaiah's um, seen the vision of God in the temple, and has his lips touched with the... the um, the coal and God says, you know, who will I send? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. And God said to him, go and tell these people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and, the, and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So do you think there's any connection with that Edmund, uh, I certainly, um, you know, that's. Um, I think that's talking around the same topic area, and I, I always sort of um, when we were talking about the parables and those that have more will be given, and those that don't have even what they have, but those that are able to grasp stuff are going to grasp more. But if your eyes, your ears are closed, then even what you think you understand, you're going to lose out on. Um, and that passage in Isaiah is is always very potent to me because um, I, I may have said before, um, I, I read it one day back in the the, the 70s, and um, suddenly what hit me was he's basically saying to Isaiah go and talk to people, but they're not going to listen to a word you say. I'm sending you as a prophet, but, but nobody will listen to you. And at the time, it hit me so hard, I just burst into tears and, and said, oh, Lord, don't, don't ever do that to me. I couldn't handle it. Well, in the fullness of time, it must have been less than a month, I had the um, uh, one of the most powerful things I've ever had with the Lord, where he, um, um, I, I got my call as a prophet. So this was almost like a preliminary to the fact that, um, you know, I thought back on it afterwards, quite a while afterwards, and realised this had happened just weeks before this um, extraordinary um, thing that happened to me, which basically said I wasn't very pleased with the idea be honest, um, took me a while to get my head around it um, because uh, prophets don't normally get along very well. Um, <laughs> and the idea did not appeal to me at all. And in partly it was because of seeing that in Isaiah, which had upset me so much. <laughs> Because prophets are usually the um, the outcasts and the weirdos, aren't they? <laughs> they're just a bit in the yeah, yeah, they're, I mean, they're, the they're always looking at things from a slightly different angle. Lateral, exactly. Lateral yeah, thinkers. Yeah. You know, and uh, thanks yeah. very much. <laughs> well, you, you don't seem to be a prophet at a loss. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the, when you read through the Old Testament, you don't often read the stories of the prophets and think, wow, they had it easy. No. no, they had to do weird things as well, didn't they? Like <laughs> acting things out, which are very yeah. strange. Yes, and not, nor do you think what a sensible, level-headed person that is. I do. <laughs> no, oh, God uses everybody. <laughs> yeah. they, but interestingly, the, with the Isaiah piece, 
where God says, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their he ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And that is exactly what did happen with the disciples and all those who were the first followers of Jesus. They did see with their eyes. They, they did hear with their ears. They did understand with their hearts and they turned and they received their spiritual healing. So. Um, but it wasn't an easy road. Um, no. They, they, you know, you get there eventually. Um, and like Segun says, um, you know, there are layers and you gradually, when you look at the disciples, it's, it's, um, <laughs> I mean, when you've got people wandering along on, uh, you know, bumping into Jesus on the um, road to Emmaus, and they still haven't got it at that yeah. point, you know. It, um, and Thomas as well didn't believe, did he, until he yeah. saw. Yeah. <laughs> so. One of my favourite people, Thomas. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. The furthest of all the disciples. Sorry, say again? Went the furthest of all the disciples. He was um, he was uh, killed on a hillside outside Bombay. Mm. Really? Yes, I heard that. Yeah. Mm. So when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Where wherever he went, into villages, towns or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. Mm. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Mm. So there we have the edge of the cloak again, Edmund. Yeah. He is risen with healing in his fringes. The edges of his garment is a way of translating that. Mm. That's where they got that, that um, popular notion that if they touch the 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 fringes of if he was the messiah then they only had to touch the fringes of his garment they'd be healed he is risen with healing in his fringes or as we sing in his wings yeah because it's the same word kana right. it means corners it means wings and whatever it's a yeah we're going to try and do a bit of chapter 7 though it's quite a big Piece. I think what we'll do is we'll probably start it now and see how we get on. So Edmund, I'm going to put up chapter 7, 1 through um, 23. So quite oh, a long passage, but we'll, we'll see how we'll see how we see where 23 is on here. Okay. Yeah, I got you. The Pharisees and some of the Torah teachers who had come from Jerusalem gathered together with Yeshua and saw that some of his disciples ate with richly unclean hands. That is, without doing nitala yadayim. That's what it's actually in Hebrew. I'll talk about that when we get to it. For the Pharisees, and indeed all the Judeans, holding fast to the tradition of the elders, do not eat unless they've given their hands a ceremonial washing. Also, when they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they rinse their hands up to the wrist, and they adhere to many other traditions, such as washing cups, pots, and bronze vessels. The Pharisees and the Torah teachers asked him, why don't your disciples live in accordance with the tradition of the elders, but instead eat with ritually unclean hands? Yeshua answered them, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it's written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They work, their worship of me is useless because they teach man-made rules as if they were doctrines. You depart from God's command and hold on to human tradition. Indeed, he said to them, you've made a fine art of departing from God's command in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honour your father and your mother and Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say, if someone says to his father or mother, I have promised as a Corban, that is a gift to God, what I might have used to help you, 
then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus, with your tradition, which you have handed down to you, you nullify the word of God, and you do other things like this. Then Yeshua called the people to him again and said, listen to me, all of you, and understand this. There's nothing outside a person which, by going into him, can make him unclean. Rather, it's the things that come out of a person which make a person unclean. When he had left the people and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he replied to them, so uh, you too are without understanding. Don't you see that nothing going into a person from outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and it passes out into the latrine. Thus he declared all foods ritually clean. It's what comes out of a person, he went on, that makes him unclean. For from within, out of a person's heart, come forth wicked thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, indecency, envy, slander, arrogance, foolishness. All these wicked things come from within, and they make a person unclean. Thank you, Edmund. That is quite the long passage. Um, just as a start, before we get into the detail, um, Right at the beginning, uh, I think in the first month, that w first week that we studied Mark, we talked about what the um, who Mark might have been writing for, and there's the different opinions. Some that it was for the uh, for the churches more or less around uh, Israel, and others for uh, that he was writing for the Roman Church, and this. The, in the paragraphs from um, verse three and four, it really, you know, this is Mark giving quite a detailed explanation, backstory to people who would not know what, um, what he was referring to. So I think that gives quite a good indication that it's possible that he was writing um, to the Roman church rather than the church around, closer to the, to the Jews who might have had more of an understanding. They have any... Thoughts on that, Edmund, before we get into the meat of it? Uh, I, I think that's quite reasonable. Although um, one thing that I think um, we, we may not be aware of is that, um, the, the, just to explain, the, the, um, the um, dip washing of the hands, you have a sort of thing, imagine like a, a, a cup bowl, with a handle on each side. It's got two handles. And you tilt one over one hand. You know what, the, if you watch Muslims washing their hands, it's almost certainly based on this same thing, which the Jews used to do. Uh, and they, you would tip it over one hand, and then you grab the handle and tip it over the other. So you don't, you're, you're, uh, you know what I mean, you're independently doing it. Um, but that was a Judean practice. The Sadducees and all that sort of thing put that together originally. And it wasn't in the time of Jesus as common a practice down in Galilee. So there's a difference. And in this book particularly, where we often see the Jews said, um, the translation is almost always here, Judeans, because, um, and a lot of these suggestions that the Gospels are anti-Semitic, because they say the Jews this or the Jews that. It's actually much more likely to be Judeans. And this is one of those places where the, they're currently in Galilee region, because we know where they come from. Uh, and this is people where the tradition of the elders was a very specific set of, of sort of instructions, a way of following the law, which came from the Sadducees who had, come to Jerusalem and built up a whole culture of doing things around the temple and that they were the people who really gave instructions to the common people who knew nothing. 
whereas the, the Pharisees arise much later and they come back in about one, the main people in Galilee come back from about 160 BC and they have different traditions. So Jerusalem thinks they ought to give up things like synagogues and their way of doing things and follow the traditions of the elders, which they've developed over 300, is it, years? So that's, that's a very important divide that they're, later they did, or a lot of the traditions do get handed on post AD 70. But, but at this point, the Judeans are the ones who have, it's called the tradition of the elders. The Galileans don't follow that. I'm just going to put up, um, I've got a reasonably long passage from the commentary, which I thought was quite good. But rather than just read it, I'll put it up so you can read it as well. It would be easier to follow, possibly. And the co commentator says, there was a large body of oral interpretation of the written law. Where the written law was silent, the oral law would be vocal. By the second century BC, many Jews voluntarily assumed the purity laws that were designated for the priesthood. The Pharisees surpassed the priests in their zeal to safeguard themselves from ritual defilement and were a st strong proponent of the priesthood of all believers in the sense that they considered the priestly regulations to be obligatory to all men. The binding character of the decisions handed down by honored Jewish teachers of the law was an essential component in Pharisaic thinking. It was Jesus' failure to support the validity of the oral law which made him an object of concerted attack by the scribes. Theoretically, the oral law was a fence which safeguarded the people from infringing the law. In actuality, it represented a tampering with the law which resulted inevitably in distortion and ossification of the living word of God. The exaggerated reverence with which the scribes and Pharisees regarded the oral law was an expression of false piety supported by human precepts devoid of authority. Jesus categorically rejects the authority of the oral law. <clears throat> so I hope I haven't stolen some of your thunder there, Edmund, but do you, would you like to expand on that? Um, no, I think... Um... Uh, I, I think I would adjust some of that, but um, that's, well, go on then. Do, that's, do that's a debate that's been going on a, a while among um, what we're the way we're used to thinking about something. And I think if you talk to some Jewish people, they might tweak a few little bits there, but I'm not absolutely clear on both sides. So I would tend to... Um, you know, I, I think that was a good general. Um, I make a slight distinction between um, how they use the word oral law, because if you come at things from another direction, you could say that the Sadducees only accept the five books of Moses as, as fixed, the oral law they don't like. Now, in that sense, um, we're not quite talking about the oral law in the same way. Um, and I think there's a bit of confusion because of using that term, the oral law. Uh, and I think, therefore, we, we sometimes, um, something that belongs in one gets into the other is the only way I could say it. And I can't unwrap it all clearly enough. Um, but I, I think it's a, that was, you know, that's, there's a lot of good stuff in what was there. Something, so, something I pick, picked up on there, just um, as you were reading through it, it, it was, I think you were saying that the, the Pharisees believed in the, the priesthood of all believers, um, and, and, yet, and yet, and they used that to say that everyone should, everybody should... Uh, you know, be ultra religious and um, uh, follow all their their laws, but it it curiously it, it didn't it didn't also imply that the the average person had any uh, priestly authority or, or access to to God and and God given wisdom of their own standing. Oops. Yes, the I think it's the. Um, 
what the Pharisees, you know, as you said, the Pharisees picked up that rather than just the priest keeping themselves ritually pure, everyone should keep themselves ritually pure. Whilst, yeah. Can I, um, I just put yes. something in there? Where that comes from... <laughs> Hang on, I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> Busy at the moment, young man. Yeah, cheers. Adrian again. <laughs> ah. Tell him. Tell him to jump on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The one of the things there that which I do know about is that um, um, the point at which the Pharisees um, start to, as it said in there, uh, suggests that uh, priesthood of all believers. That's actually what happens when the temple is taken out of the way. The destruction of the temple, all of a sudden, all the ceremonial smells and bells bit is gone. And, and they're all going through a massive crisis of how do we cope without our temple? And it's the Pharisees who point back to uh, you are a kingdom of priests and therefore, there begin to be certain elements which belonged to the temple stuff, which was now gone. You say, look, even though you haven't got the temple, every man is a priest in his, in his own home. And therefore, and that's where some of the things which you'll see in a Jewish home with the mother and the father doing various things. And the table became your, your family table that you ate around was your altar. And the lighting of the candles of the mother, which you'll have seen at certain times, that had connotations back to stuff. So it's at that point that they begin to adopt and certain things began to come into the synagogue, which hadn't been there before, which made it more, uh, uh, there was more um, sort of shape to the way, religious shape, you would say, instead of it being freer. It becomes tighter in the synagogue. And that's, that's when you begin to have the separation of men and women sitting together in the synagogue. You don't, you start separating them. And it becomes more, um, and it's a res result of losing the temple and saying you are a priest in your own right. Look, you can be a mini temple in your home because you have the Passover in your home, don't you? You have Sabbath in your home, don't you? So that's when that begins to happen. Um, before that, they would tend to be, Pharisees and Sadducees would be not in much agreement. Uh, and you've got a majority of Sadducees would be in the Sanhedrin and a minority of Pharisees. So when Paul comes along and he finds himself in a difficult situation, he appeals to the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin and that starts a sort of, we think if an angel's appeared to him, he should, who are we to say, you know? Um, so that's that situation, because normally Pharisees and Sadducees did not get off. But once the Sadducees have been taken out the way, then we can be a little more accepting of their world and introduce some of their stuff into ours. So that's when that change happens. So Jesus gets challenged by the uh, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law on some of the cleanliness laws. And he really does uh, go in quite hard. I mean, he, this isn't a mild rebuke. This is a, you know, pretty full on, um, you know, taking them to task. And he focuses on the commandment, you know, honor your father and mother. And there's this thing that we refers to as Corban and if the commentator says if a son declared his property Corban to his parents he neither promised it to the temple nor prohibited its use to himself but he legally excluded his parents from the right of benefit having done this and then regretted it the scribe's ruling was that he could not break the vow Jesus categorically rejects the practice of using one biblical commandment to negate another. In their concern for the fulfillment of the letter of scripture, the scribes forgot that the law was provided not for its own sake, but to benefit men. 
And so Jesus takes them to task on this one very particular thing where by whatever this Corbyn is, and Edmund might be able to fill us in more, if you declared something Corbyn, you could still use it, but you prevented your parents ever having access to it. And once you'd done that, you were not allowed to then regret and change your mind. And uh, Edmund, have you got any background on Corbyn? Um, no, I, th I think, um, I mean, different people... Um... I think I think that covers it pretty much. I did see something today which said that the the, the Mishnah eventually comes up with something later on, which is basically comes out of um, uh, if you make a vow and then circumstances mean that the vow, as you said, causes problems in some other area, which would mean breaking a rule or something. There was a way they worked out for releasing even Corbyn, but I think that comes later. And um, an example of uh, that has always stayed with me is a um, a thing called shalitza in in Hebrew. I think it's said that way. Um, when a woman's husband died without any child. You know the one about marrying the brother? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's there so that um, the, the bit in the Old Testament says if the brother refuses to marry her, then uh, she has the right to take him to the people at the gate of the city and, and say this man refuses to do his duty, which means that she'd be vulnerable as a widow and what have you. So he's removing her security by refusing to marry her. And they would then say, is this true? And if he still wouldn't do what he was supposed to do, she um, uh, uh, was told to take off his sandal, spit in his face and, and throw the sandal and say, this was a man who had his sandals cast. And it was a, it was a shame on the man. Well, what happened by tradition down the years, and the thing where I first came across it was a little book uh, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Um, one of the, the, the uh, suggestion is it's very likely that one of the Rothschild daughters got caught with this because what the thing has become is that they would take, I mean, if they're in Europe, they can't have multiple wives. So this thing is there to release the woman, okay? But what it's become is that they would take off the man's, they'd go through the formal bit, I cannot marry this woman because the laws of the country say so. So then they would take off his ordinary shoes and put on a ceremonial sort of tall boot with a soft, um, you know, the leg bit, with laces wound round and round and round. So it's a long boot with laces wound and then tied in a knot. And then she, I don't know how this bit came about, with one hand tied behind her back, has to undo the knots and take the boot off. He moves slightly out of the way so that she doesn't actually spit in his face. Um, uh, and uh, then she is then free to marry whoever she wants, because they've gone through the ceremony. But if the poor woman cannot, with one hand, untie these knots and unravel that boot, the thing which was meant to be a freeing for the woman then becomes a total bondage. She cannot marry anybody else. So what was from God a thing that released her and didn't give any shame on her, put the shame on the other man, it becomes up to her. If she can't do it, well, sorry, dear, you've lost, which is a total reversal of what the original law, and that's in place today. Mm. And that's a perfect example of taking the tradition and making it mean the exact opposite. It's not a, 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 an act of grace to free a widow, it's a way of binding her. 
I mean, they don't set out to bind her, but, oh, well, that must be God's will. Sorry, dear. So that's always stayed with me, that. And as I say, they think one of the Rothschild daughters was was stuck and couldn't marry the person she wanted to marry as a result. So Jesus comes down really very vehemently against these uh, practices of taking the law and actually making the uh, oral law more important than the original written law of God. And he then goes in, having said it privately to the scribes, he then goes in front of the crowd and says, listen to me, everyone, and understand this, nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And again, the disciples don't get it. And as it says in the um, NIV, um, are you so dull? Is Jesus' comment to the um, disciples. Again, very straightforward. Um, and Jesus then goes on to explain to them, you know, this, it's not what you eat. It's the behavior that makes you unclean. So we've kind of galloped through that a little. So I apologize for that. But we are now five minutes over. Can I just make one little point? And on certainly, yes. It, it draws a parallel in normal in Leviticus. Uh, the emissions of whatever sort are, uh, are make you unclean, whether it's leprosy, um, all, all sorts of things, even, even semen or whatever, they all render you ritually unclean. It's not sin, but you, you, you can't operate in the environment of the temple. And he's drawing a parallel between stuff coming out of the body, which everybody knows makes you unclean, whatever it is, and the things that come out of the heart. So he's, he takes something they know and then makes the point that in the same way, these things come out of the heart. So it's not just bodily fluids, if you like. By drawing this parallel, it's what is in your heart that renders you properly unclean so thank you very much ladies and gentlemen i am going to stop the recording now uh, sagan needs to know about next week oh yeah